Okay, I don't know where we were, but uh, uh, 19. 19, go ahead. He also instructed the second and the third and all the others who followed the hearse. You are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him, and be sure to say, Your servant Jacob is coming behind us. For he thought, I will pacify him with these gifts. I am sending on ahead, but later, when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. There you go. So that, that confirms what we were talking about earlier. He's trying to get him pacified. So as he and sends them out with the servants, with the animals, they're, they're Esau's? And they're his property. Servants and animals alike. They're... They're all all belong to Esau. Now. Go ahead, you're done for. That's it. You're you're no longer a part of Jacob's people, and uh, yeah, you're a gift. And so that that's just the way it is. And um, Jacob instructed him, make sure you know or tell them that I am following behind. I'm not running. I am coming. So he's not only trying to appease him; he's trying to keep him understanding that he's willing to meet face to face. He's not just trying to hide. So, I mean, he's, he's taking logical steps that anybody would if they thought the process through. This is the only thing I can do. This guy's got 400 people on camels. He doesn't have family with him. I can't move quickly enough. I've got to move forward. So, that's what's... This, this verse is a picture of flesh and works. Oh, absolutely. Rather than finally back here in verse 9, he finally prayed... And yeah. ask God for help. Right. But he's still trying to fix it. Oh, he, he, yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. Yeah. So that's right. Okay, go ahead. Wherever. 21. 20, 21. So Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him, but, but he himself spent the night in the camp. Keep going. Oh, yes. <laughs> that night Jacob got up and took his two wives with two maid servants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. And he had sent them across the stream. He sent all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And the man wrestled with him until daybreak. Okay, you know, it, it, there are a lot of opinions on who this guy is. We're going to read about it and then we'll talk about it. But go ahead, just so you know, this is an interesting story. When the man saw that he could not overpower him. He touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Okay, now Israel is... What's that? So the man was God. Well, or, yeah, it, it would be... I believe, this is just me, I believe that it is the manifestation of God in the person of Jesus Christ, who is master of time and space, and so I believe that it is literally Jesus that he is fighting with. That does not mean I'm right. Some people say it's the pre-incarnate Christ. To me, it makes no sense to be a pre-incarnate Christ. Yeah. This is an incarnate person. This is a person of flesh that he is fighting. And so I believe it is Jesus. However he did this, he orchestrated history past, present, and future in a way that he presents himself in these different occasions. One of them is going to be when Joshua goes over the river with the people of Israel, and there's the commander of the army of the Lord standing there. Then he says, are you for us or against us? He says, no, but as the commander of the Lord's army, I am here. And then he says, take off your sandals. These are holy ground. The only other time that's mentioned in the whole Bible to do that is when Moses meets Jehovah at the burning bush. So I believe that this is Jesus, God incarnate, and I do not know how, how he did it, because we think linear time. We're thinking time goes forward, but he is outside of time. He is the master of time and space and matter. And I just personally, and I don't want to make that doctrine for you guys, but when I read the Bible, I see not a pre-incarnate Christ, but the eternal Christ. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. Anyway, um, just me. Please don't, uh, don't uh, you know, go fighting with that in your head too much. But that's just the way I believe it because of who Jesus is. Anyway, um, uh, some translations will say that Israel is prince of God. Other translations will say that the name Israel means he struggles with God. In this context, it says, but your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and man. I would tend to believe that the proper translation of Israel is struggles with God. And that name is a double entendre. In other words, it doesn't just mean that he struggles with God, fighting against God, but he also struggles with God on God's behalf. 
depending on if he's in favor with God or if he's out of favor with God. You see what I'm saying? You can struggle with God in a, a, a fighting sense or you can struggle with God on his side in two different senses. And so I believe that Israel is properly translated. He struggles with God. But it can also mean prince of God. And, um, Not the face of God? No, that would be uh, pay, pay his face. So... Uh, that would, Okay. Pay, pay L or uh, anyway, I'll have to think about that just a second. But no, it would be either Prince of God or he struggles with God, depending on who the uh, translator is. But um, so here he is, he's fighting with this person, this, I believe, eternal Christ that is there. And this is the initiation of the people of Israel. In other words, you have the covenant coming through Abraham, the covenant coming through Isaac, the covenant coming through Jacob. But from Jacob on, the 12 sons all received the inheritance, whereas before only one was receiving the inheritance. Now you have, like, a, when you see the number 12 in the Bible, it is a governmental structure, such as the apostles, the 12 apostles. This is the governmental structure of the people of Israel, 12 tribes of Israel. So it, it, it's now branched out into the people of Israel from this point on. Um, and um, so he's fighting with them. The man can't overpower him. And he uh, touches the socket of his hip. And we're going to read the uh, uh, in 32 in a second here about that. But... Um, uh, I had one other thing I wanted to tell you. Hang on. Uh, I will not let you, go and let you go unless you bless me. He's asking for the blessing, and here it comes. And uh, uh, there was something I wanted to tell you, and I'll probably remember it tonight at 3 o'clock. But go ahead, T verse 29. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Oh, wait, we, we missed. Oh, oh that's okay. It, it, said, that's... Please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Okay, this is the same, this is what I wanted to tell you, and we just hadn't read the verse yet. If you go to the book of Judges, let me find it, uh, Joshua Judges, and you go to the account of the birth of Samson, it's probably around chapter 11, 12, 13, somewhere around there. We're going to see, let's see here, um, Gilead's, okay, Jephthah's vow, Manoah's wife promised him a son, and where is it? Um, that must be in 13, okay? And Isn't that interesting back in, in 27 where he asked him, where his father asked him what his name was and he lied and said he was Esau? I, I, what do you think? There, he's asking him again. What is, he'd already asked him, what's your name? He'd already told him what his name was and he's asking him again. At the time he was name? taking the blessing from Esau. Yeah, when he stole he the blessing from... Him. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, I was thinking of judges and I'm looking for something and I just totally went blank on what you were saying. But that's right, what is your name? Esau. He says, I'm your son Esau. He's, she, he, she's making the comparison all the way back to the account when he deceived his father Isaac. Now he's doing the same thing here. Uh, what I was thinking of is in Judges um, 13, and it says, um, uh, verse 17, Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? That when your words come to pass, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing as it is wonderful, or some translations will say it is beyond comprehension. Okay, the same thing is asked of the angel, who is the angel of the Lord, and how do we know that? A little further down it says, um, uh, it happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, and the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Mary, Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. Um, so they knew that it was the angel of the Lord. This is the same person, once again, that was wrestling with Jacob, at this particular area. It's the same person that is standing there. He is intervening actively in the history of Israel. This is a person, okay? This is, this is somebody, but he has the power not just to be physical, but he has the power to ascend in the flames. Well, how did Jesus ascend after the resurrection? He ascended up in the cloud. So the same, I, I don't care what anybody says. They can, they can come up with any commentary they want if you're a Jew, you're not going to believe in Jesus and you're going to make something up in your head about this. It's the person that was walking with the two angels that met Abraham. This is the same person that shows up again and again and again in the Old Testament. He is presenting himself there to the people of Israel and I believe that it is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, not pre-incarnate, but actually Him. 
how it happens, once again, I know that's a hard concept because even I can't get my mind around it, but I don't believe that he came and presented himself in human flesh before he became human. I just don't believe that. I believe that he is Jesus Christ who was human because of his mother Mary and because of the Holy Spirit, and he is over time and space. And he proved it in the room when he showed up in the locked room. He proved it at the ascension. He can do things beyond the ability of a normal human being. He is God incarnate. Anyway, I don't want to make doctrine for you on that. I just want you to know how I feel about that. And nothing's going to change my mind. Nobody is ever going to say to me that something that is going to change my mind on this particular thing. I believe that that is Jesus. And somebody on Saturday night does not like when I say that. But I believe that it is Jesus that we know as Jesus. Anyway. Um, and how precious. What a precious picture. Hey, him intervening in his own yeah, history. Absolutely. And this morning when I was walking, this little Jewish lady that I told you about, she joined me, you know, in my walk. I rarely see her, but this yeah. morning I saw her. And one of the things she said to me was that she was reading this book and this guy believed that that, uh, let's see, things happen because of, uh, things are, are changed because of um, faith and hope and luck, of yada, 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 you know. Oh, yeah, no. You know, and I looked at her and I just said, I That's the hand of God. God. He's I not believe in luck. He's trying to wake and, people up. And, you know, and I just said this morning after that, I thought, Lord, give me another chance to tell her that it isn't luck, it's God. Right. He is he is so involved in your life in every, every minute, everything that happens in your life, if you could just see, see it. it. That's right. Instead, we go to horoscopes. We go to Absolute. all these other things. There's no such thing as luck. No, no. That is God. Hand. That's Acts 17, 26 through 28, where it says that he put us in exactly the right time, yes. in exactly the right place in human history that we yes. would seek after him. And yes. instead of seeking after the yes. things that happen in our life, that show us that he is him. Instead, we're looking at the stars. We're looking at the constellations and all these other stupid Everything things. He told us not to look at. That's right. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Real quickly, before we get back out of Judges, they asked him, what is your name? And it says, why do you ask me my name, seeing it is wonderful? That is the same word that is used in Isaiah 9, 6. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Wonderful Counselor, Peleoetz, okay? That word there is wonderful. And that's why I say, Isaiah said this person's name is wonderful. And he says, why do you ask me my name? Because it's wonderful, which can also mean it's beyond comprehension. In other words, it's, it's a wonder, right? But um, that's why it, it's clues like that in the Old Testament that tell me that what we are dealing with here is more than just what they call a theophany. A theophany is a manifestation of God in the Old Testament before the coming of Christ. Now some things are theophanies, like the, the uh, column of smoke and fire that led the Israelites. That's a theophany. It's God, uh, a presentation of God basically is what a, a theophany is, okay? Or the burning bush is a theophany. Some of those things are theophanies, but when a man stands there and directs the course of Jewish history before it even happened, I think that that is more than just a simple theophany. I think it is Jesus somehow intervening in his own history. And as bizarre as that sounds, that's just the way I believe it. So please carry that with you if you want. If you don't want to, I, it doesn't bother me a bit. If you take offense at that, I'm sorry. I can't change what I think in my head. And that's what I see in these particular passages. So anyway. Um, okay, so uh, we were at uh, verse uh, 29, I think. Oh, you, you read 29. Go ahead. And he got his blessing. It says he did bless him. Asked for the blessing. Asked his name. And uh, go ahead, verse 30. Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, This is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Okay, Peniel. Pe is the word face. Okay, Peniel, face of God. Okay, so there you go. I, uh, that's, that's where the name face of God comes from, Peniel. All right, he named the place Peniel. All right, and um, for I've seen God face to face and my life was preserved. Well, he knew that it was God, and yet what does it say in the New Testament about God? No man has, has or can see God. God lives in an unapproachable, uh, uh, dwells in an unapproachable white light whom no man has seen or can see, and then it says that God is spirit. Okay, if he saw God, then he saw 
Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father.